Hi, I'm Gwyneth Jones of the Translators Studio. We specialize in teaching the art of translation. In this video, I interview John Warne, the CEO of the Chartered Institute of Linguists, about the DIPTRANS exam. I took this opportunity to ask John all the questions we've always wanted answers to about the DIPTRANS, like, why no internet? John shares a ton of interesting information in this interview. It really is an unmissable one. Translators, I give you John Warne. John, you graduated from Oxford University in 1990 with a BA in, I think, politics, economics, and history. Philosophy. And philosophy. Philosophy, yes. And I was wondering, how do you get from there to becoming the CEO of the Chartered Institute of Linguists? Oh, well, um, there's a story. But, uh, you know, the short form of it would be that I started my career in uh, international organizations. So the very first thing I did after leaving university was to uh, spend most of my time on the road, actually, in um, Southeast Asia, South America, across Europe, Africa. Uh, and it was a very, very exciting time. And also, you know, was the time when I was most exposed to languages. And uh, probably the highlight of that was uh, living and working for five years in France. So I worked on the launch of one of France's three mobile phone networks, We Telecom, and I did the uh, marketing and the um, advertising and campaigns for its launch. So while I was there, I uh, picked up French. Um, as you say, I didn't actually study it uh, at university, but I learned it sort of in practice. Uh, so my French is a bit slangy and, um, you know, uh, not necessarily perfect for the ambassador's drinks party. But uh, nevertheless, uh, you know, that was my personal experience of learning a language. And I think in many ways, you know, that has really been the, uh, the sort of guiding thing that has brought me around to where I am today, which is, I guess, the recognition that... Um, if you sort of apply yourself and you find yourself in the situation where you have to, it's uh, it's surprising what you can do. So I suppose I've been quite fortunate in my career in that I've worked in pretty much all of the sectors of the economy. So uh, I started international businesses, then I worked in central government, then I worked a wonderful time at the British Council um, promoting languages whilst I was there, and again working around the world, promoting UK culture, the English language, and languages more generally. Uh, then a stint in UK universities, and then finally the Charleston Institute of Linguists. So the golden thread would be, uh, I guess, internationalism, uh, but also all the way through regular exposure to languages and um, also regular exposure to uh, imposter syndrome, which is, uh, you know, the sense that um, actually I'm not sure I really know what I'm talking about uh, or I'm, you know, uh, wrestling with my own confidence. And I guess, uh, you know, the, the feeling, and that's very common, I think, for linguists that, you know, you just have to kind of hold your nerve and stick at it and uh, people will help you very often if, uh, if you do. So that's how I got from A to B uh, via quite a number of different countries and especially France. That's very interesting to hear. So you've had an interesting relationship with languages then. Yes, uh, yes. I mean, I all of, all of my languages, as I say, I picked up uh, thoroughly, uh, you know, by uh, by being in, in country. So I picked up some Spanish um, working in Colombia. So uh, all my uh, all my V's are B's when I speak um, uh, Spanish. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, I think as a consequence, I guess I didn't find languages really work for me in an academic context so well. Uh, I think it was the overwhelming experience of uh, having an exercise book covered in red ink that uh, that really sort of scared me off uh, and damaged, uh, you know, my my enthusiasm for the task. Also, you know, I was from, uh, I think, the place in the UK which is furthest from the sea. Uh, so I was, uh, born and raised in Sheffield, which is bank slap in the middle of the country. Okay. Uh, so, you know, we were a long way away from other languages. So I think the combination of um, lack of opportunity and then exercise book covered in red pen meant that the academic route didn't really work for me. But then I suppose the accidental route of finding yourself just immersed in, in another language by being there uh, worked, you know, pretty well for me. I wouldn't say that I was, you know, a, uh, 
uh, outstanding in, in terms of my ability to pick it up at all. I just basically swam in the sea and, you know, picked up, picked it up quite naturally. So I suppose where that links to, you know, my current job is I have enormous respect for people who have gone down the academic route, but I also have enormous respect for people who have, you know, developed their languages either through work or through living in a country. And I suppose, you know, again, link back to where it all started in terms of my academic career, you know, a bit of study around um, philosophy, psychology and linguistics, you know, has kind of really opened up for me just, you know, how language is the quintessential human capability. And therefore, you know, if it wasn't interesting enough already, it is the most interesting thing that uh, that human beings can do. So, um, you know, it's a joy really to work uh, at the Charleston Institute of Linguists. It really got me thinking then when you said about you don't you know you didn't go down the academic route and I don't know if if translators or people think you have to have done that to become a translator because actually um, there's a fair number of translators who didn't study languages at university and for whatever reason found themselves immersed in in their source language country and then develop the skills through other methods, possibly through night school and things, but also I think just from being thrown in the deep end and then do eventually move into careers as translators. Yes, I would, I would absolutely agree with that. And, you know, I have firsthand um, exposure and experience of that with, um, you know, parts of UK government who, uh, who train people, um, you know, for diplomatic work. Uh, and what's really interesting is that, you know, the classic route would be associated with, uh, with academic study. Um, but what's really interesting is as they've started to open up the entry to some of their programs and also I guess open their minds as I think everyone has probably done in the last few decades what they have found is that uh, some people for example some of the people doing IT work and uh, and work on computing switched across into the language track and you know got scores that were off the scale in terms of uh, language ability so you know they're all kinds of coding and decoding skills if you like so you, you know I think what what the practical evidence is from uh, from certainly from parts of government is that uh, you know in the jargon ab initio which is you know from the beginning uh, you know it's amazing how uh, the armed forces and government have the experience of bringing people through from you know no language to exceptional language in you know in comparatively short spaces of time and here we're not necessarily talking particularly in an armed forces context about people who will have you know very strong classical academic backgrounds but uh, you know the ability to to get there is um, is astonishing. So yes, I you know hats off to anyone who has gone down the academic route. I think it's a, it's a brilliant thing to do. But there are lots of routes into languages. So talking now about the Chartered Institute of Linguists, the CIOL, the Institute of Linguists was first established in 1910. The it received its royal charter in 2005. And you've joined fairly recently, I think in October 2020. That's right, yes. And so within this, this large history, I wondered how you see your role within the story of the CIOL and what's most important for you? Well, I think probably if there's one thing that, uh, you know, one thing that I would be very keen on, um, it's, I mean, I sort of set this out when I first joined it, it it's, Community is the first thing to recognize that, you know, above anything else, we are a community of people with something in common languages. So that was the uh, the first thing. The second thing was online that, um, you know, we, we really had to, uh, I think, uh, move ourselves into online assessment, but also online support um, for, for our members. You know, and that was necessitated by the pandemic uh, because that was, you know, in full in full uh, throttle when I joined. But also, um, you know, it's just necessary, I think, for the organisation to to do what it needs to do, which I think is, you know, reach internationally. Um, the third thing I said we should be about was innovation. So, um, you know, doing new things and introducing new things. And then the uh, the fourth thing was leadership to show some leadership in the world of languages and to um, to sort of uh, do our bit to make the possibilities uh, for languages and linguists 
um, more significant. And, you know, handily for memorizability for me, at least, uh, that spells out CIOL. So, um, yes. you know, it's a community online innovation and leadership for languages. Um, but, you know, that has sort of stood the test of time, really. And probably the other thing that I would pick out as being really important um, is helping people get into careers with languages. So that doesn't have to necessarily be people who are young in years. It can be at all ages and stages. Um, but I think the risk for any professional organization is that you sort of are focused on and mainly composed of the most experienced and the most you know, senior, if you like, people in your profession. And I think we need to make a conscious effort to help people into the world of work and help people into using their languages uh, because so many people sort of um, get somewhere with languages you know and then just just drop out of the uh, of the profession and ultimately you know when you come come down to the founding notion of the you know of CIRL well, why in in 1910 did they come up with the idea the idea it's in the motto is universal understanding so you know, CIOL will have been amongst a number of organisations that were set up around about that sort of era. British Council was another one where I used to work, where, you know, there was a, a quite high minded idea that we might contribute to a better world. And I do think that, um, you know, one thing I once said is, I don't think I've ever encountered someone who speaks more than one language who is bigoted it's almost impossible to be a linguist and bigoted because you understand cultures through another lens you know you can see through other people's eyes so i think that we also have a slightly you know um uh, elevated notion which you know it's a reasonable question can we ever get there but it's like all sorts of um visions it has to be a bit bigger than what you think you can actually do we have the idea that if we can increase the number of linguists in the world then we make our small contribution to um you know making the world turn in a happier way because um you know there's more understanding between people and peoples Yes, I definitely, I, the, the point that you made where you've saying, um, well, first of all, what you said about being early career, mm. we meet a lot of translators who even maybe coming quite close to retirement, who for whatever reason have a very high level in this se second language and who are thinking, can I now go into a career as a translator, maybe just to work part time, perhaps it's just something they've wanted to do all their lives, or perhaps they're, you know, coming up to 60 and they're thinking, well, I could do this into retirement for a while and it is it's a surprisingly large number of people and i do think it's true that just providing to be able to provide them that bridge to help them to get from that point of wanting to do it to actually now i'm doing it is is extremely important and perhaps well, that's missing a bit there are there are just a couple of things to say on on that you know in terms of uh you know, and as you as you kindly pointed out, um, I graduated uni in 1990, so you can work out my age, I'm not getting any younger. Um, and I think, you know, one of the delightful findings of recent times is that, uh, you know, just because you're older doesn't mean you learn more slowly. Um, actually, the main reason why adults learn more slowly than children is because we've got loads of other things we have to do as well as learning, whereas children get the luxury of spending all of their time on learning. So actually, adults um, at least match and often outperform children in learning when given the opportunity. So, you know, one thing to know is that uh, there's plenty of life in, um, you know, in older people in terms of learning capacity and capability and then the other thing is that of course we're all living longer and more healthily so this idea that there are further careers to have once you're you know kind of full-time working career you know you may choose to draw that to a close I think is absolutely something that uh, you know we we should be catering for because you know hopefully a great majority of us will will have 20 30 years you know, further to uh, to enjoy and make a contribution to society, you know, longer than would have been the case 30, 40 years ago. I mentioned to our teachers and a few of our students that I was going to be speaking you, to you today and asked them if they wanted to take advantage to ask me to pass on any questions that they might have, uh, not the kind of things that they can find on the FAC about, about the Cert Trans and the Dip Trans and your other qualifications, which obviously I'll link to your website under this video. Can I throw some of those questions at you? Yeah, go for it, Gwen. go. 
Okay, uh, the recent changes to the exam, moving online, and also, well, the DIPTRANS having two sessions now in, in January and July. Mm -hmm. Are those changes here to stay? Yes, I would have thought so. Uh, I mean, certainly the move to online, we think, is, um, uh, has opened up a whole new, uh, well, opened up a whole new market for one thing, uh, opens up a, uh, you know, much, much more flexibility, I think, for, uh, for candidates as well, uh, in terms of being able to take things from the comfort of their own home and with their own resources around them. Um, so, you know, just for all the, all the possible reasons you can think of, um, online seems to work better for, certainly works better for us and seems to work well for candidates as well. So uh, I think that's definitely a keeper. In terms of the two session model, I mean, it's kind of driven by demand really. If the demand's there, you know, we could, we could do three sessions, but um, you know, I think the two session model seems to work quite well. One thing that we may have to look at is um, the number of language combinations. We do offer the DIPTRANS in particular in, uh, you know, a lot of languages, 30 odd languages, um, and in, you know, in every conceivable permutation thereof. Uh, it's possible, I guess, that we might look at, uh, you know, maybe some differences in waves around languages that are available, um, you know, just to make it a little bit more practical and, uh, and effective you know, at our end, but we'd always want to do that with candidates, um, you know, first. So that would be the only thing that I would see as changing, but I would expect us to stick to a two, um, two session um, approach for the foreseeable future. That's good to hear. When you announced that you were going to be having a summer session, I wondered mm. whether in the longer term it might become more popular because from the perspective of people preparing, psychologically, it's that end of the academic year and it means you don't have to be working over Christmas. I hope that within a couple of years that that session will will become a permanent fixture. Yes, well, I, I would uh, I would like that to be the case and also recognizing that, you know, obviously in other parts of the world, you know, people have sort of different seasonality. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think um, it, it feels right to me a, a two session model, I think to have to wait, you know, to find yourself uh, you know, on the 1st of February having to wait a year before you can, you know, take a take a qualification feels a long time to me. Talking about the online model, mm. is it time to allow some internet resources in the exam instead of all paper-based resources? Oh, now, Gwen, that is a tricky one. Um, and, you know, in many ways, I don't think that there is necessarily a, a, you know, a conceptual problem with it. I think the main problems are practical problems. That There's, um, there's a fairness issue because uh, any online resources are you know, better in some languages and not so good in others. So there's a fairness issue around, uh, you know, what um, uh, resources, you know, would give you if you if you were translating into English, for example, versus uh, some other world languages. Uh, and of course, you know, scrupulously fair is one of the kind of guiding principles for, uh, for regulated qualifications. So that's one challenge to overcome. The second challenge, which, you know, for the sorts of candidates we have, you'd like to think wouldn't be a concern, but nevertheless, we have to respect it, is the kind of invigilation challenge. So uh, basically, to be a regulated qualification, you know, there are small things like, you know, you're not allowed to have a digital watch, um, you're not a smart watch, you're not allowed to have a mobile phone within reach, uh, you're not allowed to have other screens around you. So those are sort of almost things that come with the territory of UK regulated qualifications that, you know, feel at the level that we're offering qualifications at, you know, a little bit unnecessary. I mean, is anyone really going to use an Apple Watch to find, a, you know, yeah. something useful uh, in, in the context of doing a complex translation? Uh, I don't think so. But, you know, it's, it's just the regulatory context that we have to, you know, stay within. Um, so I think the final thing I would say is that, you know, there's always a balance in assessment between um, accurately simulating what somebody does and then, um, you know, an abstraction from that in terms of making an assessment of whether they can do it. So, you know, I think what we have to sort of balance is, I mean, we accept the fact that somebody who's working full bore for a language service company has probably got very different, you know, paraphernalia around them when they're doing that job 
than someone who is sitting, you know, at a totally stripped down environment, you know, maybe with paper dictionaries, but, you know, absolutely with an invigilator looking at them and on our assessment platform. So, you know, clearly they are two different things. But what we're what we feel is that there's an adequate read across, read across between what someone can do in the simulated environment of the assessment as a leading indicator of what they would be able to do in the enhanced environment of uh, you know having having all of the equipment around them so it would be a little bit like you know flight simulator flight simulator versus flying a plane you know can you get um, enough confidence that the person uh, in the flight simulator could safely go in and fly the plane and uh, you know in the ideal world i think the ability to have some online tools would be um, would be desirable but you know, I was on a conference call six six or so months ago with all the UK universities, and we haven't fathomed a way to do it yet between us that respects fairness and um, you know uh, and and doesn't uh, create some problems in terms of invigilation and cheating. It's really great to hear an explanation of that, John. That's the first time I've heard it explained that way, and I, it really does answer the question. Um, so thank you very much for sharing that. Thinking now about the exam papers, can you give us any behind the scenes insights into how the papers are set and marked? Yes, so uh, we have basically we have um, uh, setters uh, and we, um, you know, we commission papers uh, in good time. Uh, any paper that we uh, set, you know, gets checked by at least three people. Uh, and then there's a kind of a leveling exercise that we do to make sure that it's at the appropriate level of difficulty and then there's a significant leveling exercise to do across languages because obviously you've got to make sure that the difficulty reads across in all the language permutations so the setting exercise is um, is pretty heavy duty actually uh, surprisingly heavy duty um, but you know that's again this whole thing about assuring the comparability and fairness because what you want to be confident of is that a person taking it you know on date x is comparable with the person who took it two years ago and the person who took it five years ago and the person who will take it in you know in five years time so that's the uh, the effort that goes into into that um you know very very experienced setters and then multiple checks uh, and checks also um, across languages. And it's the same story basically with the marking. So, uh, you know, marking goes to very, very experienced markers, there's cross-checking, and then there's moderation um, across language groups and, and then across the totality of it. So, um, yeah, that is one of the things that we, uh, we absolutely you know, go to town on and, and pride ourselves on really. Uh, because you know that's the fundamental core of what we're uh, what we're in the business of. You know, making sure that um, the the standard that that people get and the mark that they get is a you know is a fair reflection and is a comparable reflection um, between what they've done and what uh, you know thousands of candidates before them have done. Yes, I wasn't actually surprised to hear how much work goes into setting because. Mm -hmm. On our courses, sometimes we want to find a mock paper or an extra paper that's of a, an approximate level, and it takes ages to even, you know, it's not like you can just open up the latest newspaper and take the first article off the front page. It's really hard to find good, good papers that are of a dip trans level or what seem to us to be of a dip trans level. Yes, that, that's right. And I think that's also, you know, there is also an issue around copyright and, um, you know, you have to be careful. Um, so there are sometimes uh, pieces that are used that are from uh, a publication. And that's one of the reasons why sometimes we can't share those. Um, one of the things interesting enough that we are aiming to do with search trans is make sure that they're all original texts so uh, they won't be drawn from a uh, copyright protected source which means that uh, although at the moment you know we uh, we haven't got as many past papers to share uh, as we would like um, in the future we should be able to share more of those resources and uh, you know, we're aiming to have some available so I can share those with uh, with people and with yourself very soon uh, some exemplar resources available for the search trans which as I say because they'll all be um, originally commissioned um, and copyright free or, or basically owned by us it means that um, it will be easier to make them available.
because I think that is one of the big questions that people have in their minds you know what, what's the tech size going to look like yeah I mean that's that's brilliant news to hear it's it really is um I mean now you have two sessions a year there's there's more past papers it's easier but it really is one of the challenges that we've we've contended with with training people for the dip trans that it's how it, you know you've got to do lots of past papers but if they're not there they're not there and so as a resource that's something that i know that all potential candidates will be very pleased to have more 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 mock papers more past papers to enable them to best prepare themselves yes yes definitely there are um, some claims that fly around on social media, things about passing the dip trans. Um, I've heard people say it's just random. You don't know, some people will pass, some people will fail. Um, or I've heard someone saying that there's only a certain percentage of candidates that will be allowed to pass the dip trans, and that's the reason for the low pass rate. What's your response to comments of that type? Well, I think you know the best. The best answer to that is you know, partly what I've said around the, uh, the cross-checking and moderation. That I think people can be confident that every paper is going to get uh, get cross-checked and moderated. So, you know that uh, that's one of the things to be aware of. I think the other thing that's quite useful, and this would be true for the uh, the dip trans and also for the cert trans, is it is worth having a look at the qualification specifications. And I'm not you know suggesting that people need to wade through all 30 pages of both of them, but there are you know a couple of useful grids inside those qualification specifications which describe the specific learning outcomes that we are seeking people um, to demonstrate and also describes in you know reasonable amount of detail especially for the cert trans uh, you know what uh, the um, specific criteria are going to be at each level of you know um, fail pass merit distinction and I think it's worth having a look at that because um, you know there is a thing about how perfect something is how many errors what would constitute a fatal error uh you know what would be a sort of an acceptable error and of course you know professional translators at the highest standard you know will set the bar very high and you know will expect something to be you know to be very correct uh, and that really is the, the standard for the dip trans you know a high bar and very correct um, and I think that's clear in the specification. Uh, the cert trans is, you know, slightly different in that the cert trans is, you know, accepting the fact that there will be, you know, people are under time pressure. They don't have all the tools around them that you would have, uh, you know, if you if you had, um, you know, your full setup in place. So the cert trans tolerates some um, errors and, uh, you know, and deviations from from perfect. But, you know, I, that would be my sort of advice to people. Have a look at those specifications and you can see, you know, what we're expecting and what, what markers are looking for. We'll link to those specifications under the video and we'll also link to our other interview about the cert trans and the video that we have about the dip trans for anyone who's watching and who wants to find that information. Yeah, I think it's also worth uh, worth saying that, um, you know, we we do do quite a lot of work with uh, with markers or assessment associates as we as we now call them um you know to make them a community and uh, you know to talk to them about what we're trying to achieve here and uh, what we're aiming for so i think that's also an important thing for people to to know that you know isolated individuals can sort of start to develop their own quirks and uh, and foibles but if you kind of bring them together and you know make sure that they're cross comparing and talking to each other that is the single best way to assure high quality marking to basically moderate and bring people back together no marker left on their own gets it right they only get it right by being part of a broader community that they can benchmark and cross-reference against and i think that would be one of the uh, the things that we've invested quite a lot of time and effort in, in the last couple of years making sure that assessment community is connected and cross cross-checking because that's the way i think you get it right it's very reassuring to hear and it's also very interesting to hear it's information that that you don't tend to have access to when you start looking at these qualifications it's great to have this this extra insight um going back to what you said i've got it written down community online innovation and leadership yes. so talking about innovation 
we love your innovations. We 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 love the search trends. We're um, very happy to see everything going online. Um, but they are coming quite thick and fast and taking us by surprise. Are there any more changes on the horizon that we can prepare for? Well, I need to, I need to keep you on your, your toes, Gwen. So, you know, we have got a few other things in the pipeline for you, but, uh, you know, you'll have to invite me back to find out about those. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we would want to uh, to expand the portfolio of qualifications. I mean, another thing that, uh, you know, a small, small change, but I think an important one, um, you know, we introduced a additional option in the semi-specialized, the dip trans, the arts and culture option. And that was based on uh, some candidate research that we did. And we got, um, you know, we asked people uh, which of the semi-specialized did they, you know, particularly like or find useful and then what else would they like? And uh, arts and culture was top of the list, you know, and, and a bit of a surprise in many ways, because we weren't necessarily expecting that to, uh, to come out as strongly as it did. Um, but, you know, that's the reason that we got the arts and culture semi-specialised in there. And, you know, and it would be very interesting to uh, to hear from people around the, um, you know, the specialised options in the dip trans in particular, because, you know, are there some that are sort of past their sell-by date that, uh, that are not really uh, the things that people are interested in demonstrating, you know, and are there some that we should introduce? So, you know, we've had um, conversations around health uh, as being a potential area that we ought to think about because the other thing to recognize is that um, you know a dip trans as, as I think people know you get a unit certificate for every part of the qualification that you pass and that's a full certificate you know which is um, uh, you know in the jargon level seven which is master's equivalent for dip trans or level six which is degree equivalent for cert trans so every unit that you take and pass you get a unit certificate for so, you know, to some extent, it's also worth looking at the dip trans as being something that you could use to top up or demonstrate a specific skill that you have. So if you're thinking about your LinkedIn profile and you wanted to say, for example, you know, if you've got museum translation or you've got gallery translation for the avoidance of doubt, I've got the semi-specialized in arts and culture and that, you know, we're working on a way to make that really easy to put onto your LinkedIn profile so that you can demonstrate you've got that specific skill. So you might have cert trans for your general translation and then you might top up with, um, you know, some semi-specialized which demonstrate the particular domain that you're most interested in or passionate about. So that's another thing we're thinking about on the innovation side, which is you know, hopefully not designed to surprise you or catch you off balance, but just gives different ways to, um, to sort of access the benefit. Because you know, the other thing to recognize is, of course, as you will know, that you know, candidates love their languages, but also you know, they, they need to make a living. So you don't want to spend more time or money on things than you need to. So if you can pick off the unit that is, you know, the one that is important for you, that is, you know, a useful thing for, for people to be able to do. I think people will be really pleased to hear that as well, because everyone knows that specialization is just becoming more and more important within translation and still being able to say, yeah, I've got that single one to prove that I am a specialist in, in you know, this area. Um, is great because another thing is that traditionally people have said, well, I've only I've only passed one unit and I failed the other two, so I don't want to put that one unit on my CV. But actually, it's saying no, put it on, on your CV. You've still shown that you've passed one unit. You've shown you've got the level. You don't have to have passed all three and wait to get the full dip trans qualification before you promote that. I completely agree. I think that's uh, that's really really important, and we've you know had a uh, had a good think about that internally. You know, to recognise that we, you know, it's this whole thing around as I was saying about exercise book covered in red pen when I was at school versus um, you know what happens and was a delight to see, for example, at the British Council with English teaching, which is kind of promoting what people can do rather than telling them what they can't do mm -hmm. so similarly in terms of our certificates it's important that they say what people have achieved not what they haven't achieved so you have achieved a unit certificate is is the important message not you have not yet achieved the full qualification because in actual fact each of those unit certificates is an absolute proof of achievement in that particular domain obviously if you have three unit certificates then you have achieved something that's bigger than probably the sum of the three units but nevertheless each of the units is important in its own right and arguably you know as you say I think particularly with dip trans semi-specialized in some cases may be more important because if you're wanting to differentiate yourself 
on a particular domain, you know, it, it is helpful to say, look, I've got law, you know, uh, as, as one of my semi-specialized or I've got science as one of my semi-specialized. So I think that's, a, you know, that's an important thing. It's already possible to do, but I don't think we make it as easy to do or as obvious to people as we could do that the individual unit certificates are all valid in their own right. If anyone is listening to this and thinking, oh, I wish they'd offer my specialization, how can they tell you? Uh, info at uh, diptrans would be the uh, the route. So info at diptrans.cioel.org.uk. Um, okay, great. I'll include and that we can, in the we show We can give notes. you the we can give you the link, or indeed, uh, you know, just the general info form that we have um, on the website. But you know, definitely, we're we're keen to hear about that because um, and you know anything that you can feed back to us from uh, from candidates that you talk to as well Gwen is really useful because you know we are actively thinking about the uh, the semi-specialized lineup and uh, you know whether we should expand it or indeed if there are some as I say where people think you know not really not really so salient you know let's swap that out and replace it with something that is more salient. That's great to hear. Just as a closing question there are a certain number of translators out there who maybe failed the dip trans uh, maybe they haven't had the best of experiences in the past when interacting with the Charlton Institute of Linguists. Is there a closing message that you'd like to give them? Well, I, uh, I suppose uh, give us another chance would be uh, would be probably the thing that, that I would say that, um, you know, uh, I, I do genuinely believe that the organisation has always had, you know, the best of intentions. But, you know, I do think that... Um, you know the world of education and the world of assessment has has transformed in the last you know 10 20 years and i suppose the easiest way to explain this without saying anything you know too specific about the past at ciol is my experience in universities where certainly you know if you look at um, elite universities you would have had people and still have pockets of people tragically although fewer and fewer who would think that a university degree is basically like a sort of a high jump or a pole vault that uh, you know the purpose of, uh, of university degrees is for people to you know some people to fall below the line so um, you know certainly in the universities I worked in I did every now and then encounter people who who were almost delighted in in setting the bar at a level for the purposes of demonstrating that some people wouldn't get there but you know that is absolutely not what a university education is about these days uh, it's about you know helping people to achieve everything that they can achieve and I think that's the the shift that we're also seeking to make you know make it about achieving what everyone can achieve uh, and absolutely not having the notion that um, you know there is uh, there is a bar and, and some must fall below it uh, so you know, I think it. I think it is a broader cultural shift in um, in education, and you know, to the extent that people who uh, do assessment for us also very often do assessment in universities uh, and are you know, and as well as being linguists in their own right. I think the you know the the positive thing about all of this evolution is that pretty much anyone who's in education these days. Uh, who's got their head screwed on the right way is thinking that the the purpose of education is to help people advance not to fail well thank you so much john you've given us so much information there and you've been very open and honest and i know that everyone who's watching this interview will will have appreciated everything that you've given us here thank you very much that's wonderful gwen thank you i hope you enjoyed this interview from the translator's studio we specialize in teaching the art of translation and in preparing translators for certification through the DIPTRANS exam. If you like our content, please let us know by clicking on the subscribe button. See you in the next video.